Lots of developments today in the Israel-Gaza conflict, uh, not least at the United Nations, where the United Nations Security Council has called for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza after the United States did not veto the measure in a shift from its previous position. The United Kingdom voted in favour of it. Now, it also demanded the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages. And it's the first time that the Security Council has called for a ceasefire since the war began in October. October. There have been various failed attempts over the months. They were either vetoed by the United States or vetoed by Russia, vetoed by China. But today they passed this resolution. I do think it's a little bit of a of a landmark. Now the Israelis are absolutely furious with the United States for not vetoing it. Um, in a very strong rebuke, a statement from the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's office said the US had quotes abandoned its previous position, which had directly directly linked a ceasefire to a hostage release. Regrettably, it said, the United States did not veto the new resolution. Now, the statement said this harmed efforts to release hostages by giving Hamas hope it could use international pressure on Israel to achieve a ceasefire without freeing the captives. Now, they also uh, have decided to cancel meetings between an Israeli delegation and US officials in Washington that were were scheduled for this week, which I think is a slightly childish thing to do, because given that the United States is Israel's main ally, you would have thought that they would have wanted to use every opportunity to explain to the United States their point of view. And yet they've cancelled it. I said in the talk up, it's like biting the hand that arms you. Uh, and I don't, I, well, I suppose I did say that flippantly, but it, it's actually quite serious, isn't it? Because uh, there were calls last week for uh, the Western countries, including the United States, to impose an arms embargo on Israel, which is what Canada has done and one or two other countries. And there's pressure on the UK to do it. Um, so I, I think that was a, a rather idiotic thing to do. My question to you is this. Given that the United Kingdom has now supported calls for an immediate ceasefire, if you go on these marches every Saturday, what else do you want the British government to do? Now, after the vote, the UK's permanent representative to the United Nations, Dame Barbara Woodward, told the Security Council why Britain backed this motion. The United Kingdom has long been calling for an immediate humanitarian pause leading to a sustainable ceasefire without a return to destruction, fighting and loss of life as the fastest way to get hostages out and aid in. That is what this resolution calls for and why the United Kingdom voted yes on this text. Now, Yotam Confino joins me now, foreign editor of the British newspaper Jewish News, who joins us from Tel Aviv. Uh, Yotam, very good evening to you. What's your personal reaction to the events of the United Nations this afternoon? I think we should start with uh, the way that Prime Minister Netanyahu has handled this. It's a very childish and and not very constructive way of of, uh, responding to this. First of all, he's creating an artificial... uh, crisis between Israel and the United States. There is no crisis. He is making this up for his own personal gain. It's very clear. Because if you look at what's actually happened, the United Nations Security Council voted on a on a resolution that actually benefits Israel. If Israel and Hamas were to abide by this, which they won't, but let's say that they will, Israel will get all of the hostages out, all of them, they won't have to release any uh, terrorists from uh, from Palestinian prisoners. All they have to do is is uh, is simply stop hostilities for a couple of weeks, and they'll get all their hostages back. That is a much better deal than what they're currently negotiating with Hamas. So it's not. It makes no sense to go out and lash out at your only close ally, which is why I'm saying this is an artificial. Um, uh, artificial uh, sort of issue he's creating with the United States only because he thinks that he can get some some cheap points in Israel because uh, bashing the United Nations is usually quite uh, it's, it's a cheap way of getting some sympathy among Israelis. How damaging is it to Benjamin Netanyahu that um, the veteran Israeli minister uh, Gideon Saar has tonight resigned from the government? 
Well, it's one step in the in the wrong direction for him. But um, Gideon Saar was a minor player in all of this. It will start becoming much more difficult for him once Benny Gantz leaves. He's the war cabinet minister. He's the one who's very popular. He's Netanyahu's rival. He's the one that the United States would like to see become the next prime minister. When he leaves and when he takes his other fellow lawmakers with him, then Netanyahu is back with his 64 mandates. Uh, which is basically a far-right coalition and some of them are very rogue and very unpredictable and that will become an issue for him you said when not if yeah because it will happen first of all there are so many um crises waiting for this government to handle a whole different issue right now which is not being talked a lot about abroad because it's a minor domestic uh issue is uh is a draft bill that would exempt ultra-Orthodox from, from uh, going to the army. Now, this is a domestic issue, but it's something that has been talked a lot about this week. And Benny Gantz has threatened to simply leave the coalition because of this. And internally inside the coalition, there are also certain allies of Netanyahu's, in Netanyahu's Likud party who won't uh, vote in favor of this. So this coalition is not going to last three years uh, in three years, they need to call an election. That's not that's not going to happen. Um, what Netanyahu is trying to do now is trying to prolong this crisis as much as possible. He is a master of navigating in chaos and on prolonging status quo. But I think I think most people think that this is uh, one crisis too too much for him. Yotam, thank you for joining us. That's Yotam Confino from Jewish News. Lord Darrock joins us now. Kim Darrock, former UK National Security Advisor and former British Ambassador to the United States and Permanent Representative to the European Union. He's now a crossbench peer. Kim, very good evening. It seems to me tonight that the sands are shifting. Would you agree with that? Good evening, Ian. Um, I think they are. Uh, this is an American shift. I think it's been coming. It's been signalled for some weeks now. If you look at the kind of rhetoric that has been coming out of the White House, the sort of stuff, for example, that Kamala Harris said about 24 hours ago. But uh, this resolution is different, and America has abstained on it rather than vetoing it, despite it not having a direct link between release of hostages and uh, uh, a ceasefire, and despite it not including language uh, condemning Hamas. Now, the White House had tried to make something of the fact it was an abstention, not a vote in favour, but it was a shift. And as you have said, this uh, petulant uh, Israeli reaction is a signal of how angry and upset they are about it. So in that sense, they recognise there's been a shift as well. And what about the fact that Britain voted in favour of this resolution? Um, again, if, you th if we think back over the last few months, David Cameron, the Foreign Secretary, seems to be in charge of the policy towards Israel now. He's always been a Netanyahu sceptic. I, I suspect you would concur with that for, from your time working with him, maybe. But uh, um, the language that he's used has also been much more Israel sceptic than maybe what was used before. I think that uh, David Cameron, on becoming Foreign Secretary um, and recognising that he wanted to make a difference, maybe his headline policy has been toughening British language and actions on uh, the Gaza conflict. So I think that's absolutely right, your assessment. And I think he's been basically two or three days, maybe a week ahead of the US each time he has said something. Remember, he has publicly mused on, on whether or not we should we should recognize a Palestinian state in advance of a uh, of a two-state solution. So he has been pushing the envelope on this. And whether he's done it in in, in deliberate coordination with the Americans or has just done it, and it so happens that the American line has toughened a few days, a few days later. I think, frankly, he's been on, on the right track on this. He does know Netanyahu well from his time as prime minister. Um, they had a superficially friendly, but there was always a bit of tension in that relationship. Mm. There's disagreements about, about Netanyahu's policy, essentially of containment of the Palestinian problem rather than seeking a solution. And, uh, you know, you're seeing that in, in British vote in favour of this uh, resolution today. I would have been astonished given... They are, they are the last few months if we had been anywhere else on this issue other than complete support. 
What would you think this does to the likelihood of a full-scale invasion of Rafa? Because if Netanyahu did that in the next couple of weeks, it really would be sticking two fingers up to now almost the entire world. That's the really difficult question, Ian, and um, I wonder that myself. But look, I think there are there are two conflicting currents here. On the one hand, Netanyahu would hate to be seen to be bowing to American pressure, you know, and he would uh, he will not want to look as if the Americans having abstained on this resolution, he said, "Oh, okay, okay, I won't do Rafa anymore." On the other hand, he will know that. I mean, he knows Israel is a profoundly divided country. He knows that his own opinion poll ratings are sub-20%. And he will know that whatever whatever people feel about this immediate issue about the American view, a lot of Israelis will be very worried if there was a deeper rift with the US than the one that's already appearing, precisely because they are Israel's strongest supporters. So he's going to try and find a way through and I don't think he will. He will say, "Okay, okay, we'll go for a, well, we'll we'll apply this resolution, go for a complete ceasefire." I suspect what he might do is try and get a deal in the other game that is going on, which is the negotiations between Egypt, Qatar, Israel, the U.S., and Hamas about uh, a linked um, uh, release of some hostages and temporary ceasefire, and that would sort of take the take the, the spotlight away from away from this UN resolution. But he's in an awkward place. But remember, this guy has been Prime Minister of Israel for more than 16 years. He is a great political survivor. 